I used to, I went through like a big, like no doubt phase and uh-huh. I, there's some great live videos of no doubt at, uh, at Red Rocks. So I'm, I'm going to go and, and, and do my, my, my Gwen Stefani thing you know, <laughs> on stage. <laughs> This is all about you, man. This podcast is about you and your journey in music and how you got to where you are now. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Are you originally from New York? I did see you went to NYU. Yeah. So I'm, I actually grew up in Northern Connecticut, up in the country, um, about two hours north of the city. My parents moved up there like in the 80s and had me. And uh, so, yeah, I grew up in a very, very rural, beautiful area sort of had a, a dairy farm on either side of my house and uh, started going to New York City when I was like 16 or 15. I started interning at record labels because I was interested in the music business. And so wow. I worked at like a little, I worked at a little subsidi- subsidiary of Warner called Green Owl for a couple of years when I went out of business, but it was run by Ben Brewer, who's like in the Groffman family. Um, or sorry, Bromfman, Bromfman, those, that's who runs Warner in that family. So I sort of uh, was in and out of the city a bunch and, and sort of meeting music people and, and running around. And then, um, yeah, applied to NYU. So I ended up going there um, and staying there all four years. And then I lived there for another like three years after college and moved to LA like uh, during COVID actually. So oh, I'm here wow. now. Well, that's fascinating. Right now. I don't know if it's a permanent move, but I'm here. It's been uh, it's been it's been good for finishing my record and meeting some people and meeting more creators. There's just a lot more um, happening here right now than than uh, in New York. So right on artistically, yeah. That's awesome. That's yeah. fascinating. You're able to get into the industry that early. I mean, yeah, I was lucky. I just sort of I you know I met friends of friends. Like one of my dad's friends worked in apparel, and he because he's an attorney and he, he had been doing like apparel deals for, for rappers. Like, Oh, cool. <laughs> it was like the guy that would hook up like truck fit and Lil Wayne, you know? And like, so he, I was always sort of interested in music. And as a kid, I would, you know, be at all these like adult parties with my parents. And he was someone that I would like link with. And he would be like, you know what a record label is? And we would talk about it. And so, um, so yeah, he sort of, I guess he got me an internship and, and that's how wow. I first started like being around music. Which that's is cool. awesome. How, how did you get into music? I mean, prior to that, uh, were you playing? Yeah, I just played a lot. Um, I I was a really shy kid. Um, like I, I had friends, but I was really quiet and didn't didn't talk to many people sort of outside of my family. And I was never particularly athletic. So um I, I just started playing music. I started taking like drum lessons when I was in fourth or fifth grade. And mm-hmm. I played violin for a little bit. I did like Suzuki method back in the day. I think my parents wanted me to like be a virtuoso and get into Harvard for it. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, NYU is pretty close. I mean, it wasn't like you, <laughs> you went to community no, no, college. <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't know. Just always, I, I just loved, yeah. I was just like a quiet kid. I had a Walkman, sat in the, like, my parents had this big SUV, you know, and I would sit in like the way, way, way back and listen to sure. like now CDs and like Smash Mouth and <laughs> now is that yeah. what you said? Yeah, I mean that, that was, was awesome. sort of my my original introduction, and then and then my parents turned me on to some 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 real albums, you know. They they were like into the Beach Boys and the Beatles and a lot of songwriter music. So I did see on your Instagram. I wonder if you're joking. Did your grandma really edit or did really direct a video for James Taylor? <laughs> Yeah, my grandma's a legend. She uh she's 96 fucking killing it. That is so insane. Fully vaxxed, living on the upper east side of New York by herself. And <laughs> fully yeah, vaxxed she, living on the upper yeah. east side. <laughs> the Patricia Jaffe story. But yeah, she um she, yeah, she she grew up in a really different world obviously and uh-huh. I think she was born in 27, 1927 and she um yeah, she moved to Paris as a kid and then came back, uh, August as a teenager, and then came back and sort of got in with some film editors. And, you know, back in back in that time, I guess probably the 40s, uh, women could only really work in the editing rooms in the film industry. So she was, oh, interesting. She was uh, cutting film and editing. And then, um, yeah, I, you know, just, just was in it for years and years and ended up marrying someone who 
was head of Columbia Masterworks, which is like was the classical label at Masterworks. Mm -hmm. And so she ended up getting into doing a, a ton of video production, like more like documentary stuff, but she did like, she did a film about Igor Stravinsky and Leonard wow. Bernstein and, and she did a lot for like, for like the Met Opera. And one of the videos she did was this James Taylor video, <laughs> which she'd been telling me about for years. And I was always sort of like, cool grandma. And then, um, I was just shooting some videos like three weeks ago. I went up to Montana with a crew uh -huh. and I was telling her about it. And she was like, yeah, you know, I shot this James Taylor video and I've told you about it. And, <laughs> you know, we had to, she was telling me about how they had to, they had to, it's shot in a barn. They shot it in a barn and they had to remove the wall from the barn to sort of build a rig for the dolly. And Whoa. Uh, that's insane. And she'd sent me the video a while back and I hadn't watched it. I had just like spaced and she was like, you really need to watch this video. And I watched it and then it sort of clicked for me. And I was like, oh, you made this insane James Taylor video. And I don't know if you watched the clip of my Instagram, but it's sort of, I did. Uh, did. Sort of like Revolutionary War, like re yeah. reenactment yeah. footage. It's unbelievable. It's so, it looks and stunning, but it's like so dated and funny. And I'm just a huge James Taylor fan too. It was like one of the first concerts I ever saw was James Taylor. So. Oh, really? <laughs> Funny, that's, like, that's, yeah, that's, that's amazing that, uh, I, yeah, I didn't know if that was like a, if you're joking or what, I'm like, I don't no, know. Dude, totally it doesn't weird. look like you're joking. No, no, she's, she's a real deal. She's, uh, she's super special. Yeah. She, uh, we started a film club too, like early in, in COVID, um, to keep in touch with our restaurant caller every day, like when everything happened and mm -hmm. we have this zoom group that meets every week and we've watched a movie every week since basically like last March and we meet wow. up with seven of us, a couple of her friends, a couple of my friends. And so she picks a movie every week and we like watch it and talk about it. And that's it's been really a really cool. good ritual. Yeah. Awesome. Well, so um, that's, that's really cool. Well, how did you get, you said you were, you got into music, you, you were playing drums and violin and a couple of other instruments. When did you start writing music? When did I start writing music? I guess like my sophomore year of high school, probably like 15 or 16 and I had my first girlfriend and she, she was a really cool like way cooler than me she was this jazz musician from Mexico from this really cool like artistic town in Mexico called San Miguel okay and she she would always write songs in Spanish and so I started just writing songs for her sort of as like a you know as like love letters almost mm -hmm. um as like a 15 year old who didn't really know how to like communicate, <laughs> sort of put it in a song instead. And yeah, I wrote a bunch of songs for her. And then that summer, I ended up going to a summer camp. There's this infamous summer camp at Berkeley called Berkeley Five Week. Yeah. That a lot of like, it feels like every musician went there when they were like 15. Or anyone that's trying to get into Berkeley. Yeah, right? right? Yeah, it's funny because it has this reputation of just being like kind of a party and not a lot of music, but I ended up going and playing a lot of music. Um, but I went, actually went for drums because I, I was playing drums at the time. I went for funk fusion drums, but I ended up going and playing no drums and just basically writing and singing the whole time and completely bombed my, uh, my drum recital because I hadn't practiced at all. But wrote a bunch of songs and then... Um, I, I got into a, an exchange program in Spain uh, that next year. So I spent my junior year of high school in, in, in a little city in Spain, actually. And then wow. that was, and I didn't have internet and I didn't have like a lot of friends that spoke English. So I ended up spending a lot of time that year really sitting and writing a lot of songs. And, and that year ended up being really important for me because I was like isolated enough from like real high school that I, I had enough time to just sort of like, sort of live an adult life at the age of 16 in Spain in a place where I had never been. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, I ended up just like writing and playing a bunch of music. And then I, I came back to America for my senior year of high school. And then that was when I really started recording. And I actually made the first like Del Water Gap record that that year in high school. Really? Yeah, it just sort of was like a band camp thing. And I didn't want to use my name. So I used Del Water Gap. And, and then that was sort of the, the beginning. And from there, like, what was the next? I mean, you obviously got into NYU. Did you continue? Yeah. So, so that uh, EP was my, my, my like uh, application to 
the program, which is called Clive Davis, which is like a recording program. Oh, yeah. I've, I've talked to quite a few people that have went oh, through, nice. through, yeah. through that program. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a good, it's a really special little program. It's changed a lot since I started and it's been really cool. But yeah, I went there and um, yeah, and I got just, to, I, You just submitted that EP as like kind of like this is the work yeah, that you, I've been you know, you have on. to write a normal essay and everything, mm-hmm. but uh, you have to turn in a creative sample too. And that record was like, me does that record still live online or did you pull it down yeah it's on Bandcamp. <laughs> oh it is still okay <laughs> on band camp yeah yeah like once in a while i'll get like some about your record for five dollars and it's like this record i made in like 2010 it's insane but um yeah i went to nyu and i actually i went to that school like really wanting to be a producer and an engineer i didn't really want to like be a performer i was really into like gear and microphones and electronics and mm-hmm. um I wanted to work at a studio and then a couple friends there heard that record and were like, this is really good. You should play a show. And then I ended up putting a band together and playing a show and we sold it out and then played another one wow. and we sold it out. And it just sort of, sort of unraveled into like what ended up being most of my college life. And then um, after college, it, it became a solo project. A lot of people in the band just like went on to other things as people do when they leave college and then sort of, between college and now it's really just become like my project to express. Sure. Yeah. So like, well, when, I mean, you're obviously doing really well with it as yeah. a full band. I mean, you're selling out shows in New York. Like what, once you went solo what was like the next big, like stepping stone for you. Was it when you put out, like, I mean, I'm looking at high tops. That song is massive on your streaming. Uh, like what was, was that kind of the kickoff or, yeah, I mean, it, it really had two lives because, like, I don't know, I don't know, like, if you went to college or if you spent time in the college scenes, but I, I did, think, but I think I'm a bit really, older than you. <laughs> well, well, what I'm saying is, like, they can be really interesting incubators for, like, bands and projects, mm-hmm. and I think that, like, the reason why Delwater Gap, like, worked in, in New York at that time was, I think, due in large part to just, like, college and this notion of, like, we were a thing for people at NYU to do. Mm-hmm. And in retrospect, I think that was really important because it, yeah, like I said, it was just sort of an incubator to like, people would buy a ticket to the show because they were friends with us and because they wanted to party and like have a good time. And um, that like allowed, I think, me to get some confidence early on and just to like practice and learn. Like, I didn't really know how to play. And I, I think it's, it was cool to sort of like have that community. So mm-hmm. it, it really was that in college. And then I ended up touring a bit end of college and like doing playing more like house shows and parties and touring a bit in like the East coast. And then when that ended, um, when I, when I left school, I, I was sort of faced with a moment of like, do I want to really even continue doing music? Cause I was like working some jobs. And then I got an opportunity to sign a little record deal, um, with a little indie label. And, and we had initially been talking about just starting over and like doing a project as like Holden Jaffe. Mm-hmm. But, um, but right around then some of my songs high tops included like that was a record that I just sort of threw online and it just started working on Spotify. And it was an interesting time for Spotify. That was like 2016 mm-hmm. playlisting was sort of like just becoming a thing. And, um, and someone at Spotify, I think it was this guy, John Stein just sort of like started putting some of my songs in playlists. And before, like we really knew what that was or how powerful that would be. And so, um, that project just started picking up. And then, you know, I just decided, you know, this is worth holding on to. And I th- I'm really happy in retrospect that I did because I think like having a project that is not my name has really allowed me to like world build in a different way and like allow like me and my name and my face to not have to always be the centerpiece. And, you know, it can be more of, I mean, like I said, just like world building around this project mm-hmm. and this name that is like an extension of me, but it's not like, the name my parents gave me so sure so once that well once you started seeing success of, of that song like did that well did it like open up bigger doors for you i mean you said you signed to a little indie label but yeah you get spotify playlisted in 2016 and now that your numbers start going nuts are people contacting you are you getting bigger shows different writing opportunities yeah um i mean it's funny to reflect on i i haven't honestly thought about it in a while and because it was an interesting time because I think that 
Yeah, so stuff started moving on Spotify, and then I sold out. I played a show that was supposed to be the last All Water Gap show. It was at Rough Trade in New York, mm-hmm. and we sold that out. It was like our biggest show at the time, and then, and then, um, yeah, and then I started working with this little label, and that was still like very chill. I was very much like wanting to stay like in in a very like indie world. A lot of the people that I was like working with were very, um, very very like indie and DIY and still playing a lot of house shows and then um started building out a little team but nothing really stuck I think that I um at that point I had sort of been doing this project for long enough that I think if I was going to add anyone to the team hire a manager or anything I really wanted to be the right thing and so I, I think I was really careful and and really um I don't know like just really careful at who I let in Mm-hmm. So I don't think a lot really changed very quickly, but I was also writing and producing a lot of music, like a lot of like indie pop stuff just for like sort of baby label artists around New York, like really just to make money. But that doing a lot of that production work and coming to LA to write for other artists as like my project was building ended up actually being really helpful because I learned how to write and produce sort of pop music or more commercial records in that time. And so as things started growing, I started being able to really like make my records on my own. Mm -hmm. And so basically by the time, by the time like things really started picking up, which was like just before COVID. So I guess like a year and a half, two years ago at this point, like Mm -hmm. I signed with an agent and I was starting to have like real label conversations and not accidentally, but sort of passively at that point, I had produced basically an entire LP worth of like, of Delaware Gap music. So, um, so then, yeah, I guess like top of COVID, um, that was sort of the first big push. I had booked a headline tour. I had booked a support tour with an artist named Girl in Red, who I love. Oh yeah, I love her too. Yeah, she's super fucking cool. Mm-hmm. I did my first like real like major label releases. I did a couple songs with 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 a label called Canvas Back at Atlantic, and mm-hmm. uh, got new management. And then obviously like COVID happened, everything sort of blew up, and um, I ended up moving to Maine for like seven months. Wow. <laughs> uh, and stayed in a stayed in like my basically a, f- a friend's parents house just to sort of be away from from New York City but you know thinking we'd spend two weeks there and end up being there for like most of the year which was wild and then um yeah Were and then writing there was like like was yeah uh, some did you have some of these other songs out like oh to a conversation stuck in your throat like was that done yeah so fired? Ode I guess Ode was like I finished probably just before COVID and then it came out like in April like okay about, it was May 1st actually about a year ago in COVID and then the release didn't really do much, but then um, uh, a couple actresses, this girl Margaret Qualley and this girl Caitlin Deaver, posted a video of themselves like doing a socially distanced dance party to the song. Oh and wow! It was sort of like the push that it needed. It was really sweet, and it ended up sort of creating a little bit of a a moment for the song. We got some cool press, and Atlantic was was able to sort of put some resources into it, and then. Um, yeah, I put out a couple more songs and then um, pretty much since then, it's just been like finishing this project that I'm working on now, this batch mm-hmm. of songs, and then um, getting ready for, I mean, a lot of searching, trying to figure out like what it means to be like a musician in COVID. I mean, I think we have a little bit more clarity right now, but even like six months ago, it was less clear like mm-hmm. what career would look like for someone at, at my level. Um yeah, and then the last four or five months has been amazing because I've just been creating a ton of art, which is always the best, you know, just like doing a bunch of sessions in LA and writing with people and shots and videos and getting to play with clothing and <laughs> all that good stuff. That's cool. Yeah, because, um, well, I did see that you put out some song or you wrote for like Maggie Rogers and, and yeah. stuff like that. Like, was that all in the in the midst of COVID or was the, were those projects that were already done prior to this all kind of shutting down? Well, the, the Maggie song is funny because it's actually from, we, we went to college together. So we made that song in um, like 2012. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, wow. we've known each other forever. We went to summer camp together when we were kids and then- That's and then, cool. Uh, and then uh, linked up in New York and 
so she actually, she, she was one of the people that sort of pulled me out on stage and made me do Delwater Gap. Um, oh, and so wow. that, that song is a song that we had done like in New York together and had sort of been sitting on and she put out a record that was like a release of a bunch of her old music. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were able to get that mixed and put it out, which was super cool. That's cool. Um, That's really cool. Yeah, it's really, it's, uh, it was a good like return to my to my roots and her. sure sure <laughs> yeah and, um but yeah like in like amidst all of all of uh yeah I guess amidst like the pandemic I have been able to do a lot of like remote writing and production stuff and then more recently like doing some more in person sessions and getting to meet a lot of artists out here and um yeah there's a bunch of actually like finishing up a bunch of stuff right now so I have some releases coming out in the next few months which should be exciting. Yeah. That's awesome. I I know you have a new single out now called Sorry I Am. And is this going to be, you have a, like a full body of work coming out. I want to hear about Sorry I Am, but uh, yeah. this is going to be a part of a whole project. Yeah. I'm finishing up a project right now. It's sort of unclear exactly what the, um, like how it will be packaged. But um, mm-hmm. I started working with this, this cool indie label called Mom and Pop that I've mm-hmm. just, been a huge fan of for years um, i love them they have yeah. such cool artists i mean they such have cool Lidlar stuff, and like, like alice merton and yeah, yeah. Some... And like courtney barnett like when oh, i yeah, courtney York, barnett. they were like one of the first like labels i knew about you know uh-huh because there were obviously like a lot of big labels and major labels and you you've heard the names but then i remember learning that there were these cool indie labels that sort of had like a brand and they had merch and they had a vibe and like yeah <laughs> And they were one of the first ones I heard about. So uh, it was, it's been super cool to sign with them and start working with them. And I mean, they're just like, they've been around and they're all super smart and have great taste. And like, it's been really cool. Like most of my team is like my age and female and like super creative. And it's just been like a really specific, I've had a few different like label experiences at this point. And it's been mm-hmm. a really, it's been my favorite version of, of that so far. Amazing. So yeah, put out Sorry I Am with them and we have a couple more songs coming out and then yeah, sort of like piecing, piecing, uh, I mean, format is so variable now. It's sort of like, there's no right way to do it. So we're, we're sort of still figuring out the best way to like package everything and package the, the visuals and all the music, but sure. Yeah. I know, like, what a different like formula now, instead of yeah. putting a record out and touring it or doing an EP and touring it, it's like, yeah. You kind of have to play this single game because there's <laughs> not a whole lot of uh, of live shows and a whole lot of opportunity to, to yeah records. But I did see that you are doing your first show in two years at Red Rocks. Yeah, and you're playing with Mount Joy. I've never been to that venue, but what a cool experience that will be. I'm, have you ever played yeah. there before? No, never been. Never played. Obviously, like wow, legendary spot. I used to. I went through like a big like no doubt phase and uh-huh. I there's some great live videos of no doubt at uh at Red Rocks. So I'm I'm gonna go and and, and do my 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 Gwen Stefani thing, you know, <laughs> on stage. <laughs> but I love it. Yeah, I'm super excited. I I I'm super honored to be to be on that show. I love Mount Joy too. Yeah, I they're, mean, they're that's really gonna be a- like I I've never I don't know them personally, but I've been a fan of their music for a while and their managers mm-hmm. become a friend of mine and um yeah, it's just cool. It's 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 cool. There's something sort of poetic about coming back and getting to play that that venue, because yeah, it's my last show was was in New York at Market Hotel a couple of years ago, and then obviously like a bunch of my shows got canceled, mm-hmm. and there was a real moment, you know, a year ago where I was like, I don't know if I'm still going to want to be a musician by the time touring comes back. Cause I was just feeling very down mm-hmm. about everything as we all were, you know, but one of my particular uh, loops about COVID was, was this thing about live, you know, losing live shows. Cause it was always my favorite part of this career. And like, so reaffirming, you know, whenever things like felt bad or a little mm-hmm. messy, I could always go play a show and like reconnect, reconnect with my music, reconnect with like fans, reconnect with whomever, my community. And so it's cool a year later to be like, I made it to the other side. Like I get to play a show and it gets to be this cool venue and it's going to be beautiful. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's and, a great and, part of the country and I'm excited. Yeah. 
And what a cool, I mean, Mount Joy would be a cool band to see there too. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. If I, I was going to go see a band at, at Red Rocks, I always tell my wife, like, I want to go, I'd want to go see like, you know, Bonnie Bear, or, like the 1975 yeah. or like something like cool or Tame Impala or something like that. Like, I feel like <laughs> Mount Joy kind of has that cool yeah, like, totally. vibe to it. It's not like you're going to go see, you know, like, I don't know some rock band there i think it would just be different to see like more like whenever you're going to say a name like yeah like fuck them yeah yeah no i don't know like it just feel like like i don't feel like going to see the foo fighters there would i mean it would be dope but it it wouldn't give the same like feel you know what i mean i got yeah it's gonna be great i've just heard it's really visually beautiful too and Mm -hmm. it's just so fun to like get to pick out an outfit you know and like rehearse a band like all this shit that like felt so normal a year ago, but like we haven't done in so long. You're like, yeah, I'm excited. Have you had a chance to play a venue that big? I mean, that's a pretty big. No, uh, I mean, uh, I think uh, the biggest room I've ever played was Irving Plaza, but it's not, I mean, Irving Plaza is maybe 2,000, 1,500. Mm-hmm. But still, this I mean. is, yeah, this is 10,000. I, I believe it's, it's probably limited capacity, at least 50%, but. It's just physically massive, though. I yeah, mean, it's a big stage, and like, do you have to approach it differently as far as your live show goes? Or no? I mean, yeah, yeah, we will see. <laughs> it, it's uh, I'm sort of going in like having a lot of faith and trying to trust my 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 abilities and my songs. I hired a, a musical director for the first time, um, and like we have a new band and like new tech, and I'm on ears for the first time. So it's it's going to be a little bit of like a you know, a little bit of a a leap, but um, I actually feel really confident. Like I've toured a ton. I haven't played venues that big, but like I've played hundreds of shows, you know, right. and I definitely had like a real like road dog mentality, like when I was in school and a couple of years after. So um, yeah, it'll be a new experience and I'm a little bit nervous. I'm sure I'll be nervous. Like when I'm in the green room meeting my hummus before, but like <laughs> right now I'm really excited and oh, you're going to kill it. <laughs> we're starting rehearsals and uh my guitar player just got to town and like he's one of my best friends and we haven't played together in a long time so it's all it's all really exciting and trying not to think about like you know all the things that that could go wrong because i i think it's going to be great either way i think even if you know even if i fall off the stage and break my leg like it's going to be great it's gonna oh be yeah epic. i think you're going to kill it i wouldn't worry about falling off the stage and breaking your yeah. leg but, <laughs> and i think just the i think it's going to be an emotional uh, an emotional night for everybody dude people i think i'm gonna cry i mean yeah, yeah. I people probably haven't seen a show in you life. know two years yeah i was talking to my friend about this and, and she was like yeah are you gonna like talk on stage at all you know because like a lot of artists like some people talk, some people don't. I was right. like, I don't, I don't think I'm going to talk on stage. And then she was like, you might just like completely break down and start weeping. <laughs> it's like, yeah, like, yeah, I think like the crowd it. might, you know, like, yeah. is this real? Yeah. Like, I'm actually seeing a show right now. <laughs> have you seen any shows yet or do you have any coming no, up? I, I haven't. I haven't seen any shows yet. I'm, um, yeah, <laughs> I'm seeing some popping up, which is exciting, um, but mm-hmm. I haven't. I don't have anything on the books to go see yet. So yeah. where, where where are you right now? Uh, I just my family and I just we just moved to Nashville. Um, oh, sick. From, San, from San Diego. So I was cool. born and raised uh, in in Southern California, but now we're we're here. We love it here, but we haven't had a chance to go out and and see anything yet. So um, yeah. kind of Nashville's so cool. I we love, love it. It's great. <laughs> you a Briston Maroney fan? Um, I I've had him on the show. Oh no way! Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, he's a he's he's a Nashville legend, local legend. Yeah, I've, <laughs> and I've, and outside of Nashville, legend, but he's super <laughs> cool. And whenever anyone like tells me they're from Nashville, I always wonder if they've met him because I know he's like he's he's around around those parts. Yeah, yeah, I've had him on here before. So yeah, that's, that's cool. Um, and dude, thank you so much for doing this. Really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Um, I have one more question for you. And I, and I also want to comment real quick on another thing on your Instagram. I thought was hilarious is that you put that if you throw your social security number in the comments for a free t-shirt. I was like, that's funny. Um, <laughs> uh, but I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists. Oh, that's, that's a good. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think, I mean, 
I can tell you the best piece of advice that I've gotten. I'll give you the two best pieces of advice that I've gotten. Okay. One, one thing that I have been pushed to do constantly over the last like seven, eight years since I've been doing music and as it's gotten more serious and as it's become like my life, I think the people that really love me and care about me have pushed me to check in with myself a lot and really, really ask like what I'm getting back from music, what I'm getting back from being an artist, what I'm getting back from Dillwater Gap, which I think has been really helpful because I think in a lot of ways it's like a relationship and that you do have to renew your vows once in a while. And I think really taking an active practice because it's not always an easy career and it's not an, always an easy path to like be an artist. I think one thing that I've really benefited from is like really actively checking in and being like, do I love this? Yes, I love this. And one of the things I used to do before shows when I was nervous is I would look in the mirror and I'd say, you love your job. You love your job. You love your job. You love your job. So that's always really helped me. Renewing vows. And the other thing, when I was in college, I had this songwriting teacher who got me into journaling. And um, and uh, I think that like, for for not all artists are writers, but I think a lot of them are. A lot of them write songs, write their songs. And I think that um, for anyone that it is, I think it is always, 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 always worth one's while to invest in getting better at the craft of writing and spending time with a pen and paper, whether it's journaling, writing essays, writing songs, because I think when everything else goes away, you know, when your career goes, when your fans go away, when your youth goes away, when your voice goes away, like you'll always have your writing and you'll always be able to use that and create. And I think it's also just like the most direct line to like who you are as a creator, you know? And um, so journal, <laughs> journal every day. Bring me the best word.